any given question, I think you could say safely, a politician uh, won't answer it, uh, a lawyer will change it, and a mediator will overcome it. Um, I'll talk this morning about uh, resolution of international trade disputes, not only by uh, mediation, um, also by traditional means. So the topics I'd like to address this morning are uh, firstly some of the features or idiosyncrasies of international trade disputes. Secondly, um, one or two examples of the cultural challenges that can arise. Um, how uh, these disputes, international trade disputes are traditionally uh, dealt with or have been traditionally dealt with, then the new ADR options, and finally enforcement. And then if there's still time, you can go off and have a nightcap before a good night's sleep. So let's start with some of the idiosyncrasies of um, international trade disputes. And I guess the key distinctions between uh, domestic disputes on the one hand and international ones on the other is that the latter involve uh, preliminary issues of applicable law and jurisdiction, uh, which law will govern and which country, uh, which country's courts, uh, or in which country will the arbitration or court proceedings be held. And another important factor, very important factor is enforcement. Of course, there could be enforcement issues with a domestic case, but those are much more intense or much more uh, challenging when you have uh, a creditor in one country, a debtor in another, and perhaps that's debtor's assets spread around uh, uh, yet further countries. Now, often there will be a chain of contracts, and I'm thinking particularly of a chain of uh, international sales contracts or charter parties uh, between parties in a number of different countries uh, with different cultures and different legal systems. Uh, so it's not at all unusual to have, say, a chain of charter parties between perhaps a ship owner at the top of the chain and a cargo owner uh, come voyage charterer uh, right at the bottom of the chain. And for each of the contracts in that chain to have different law and jurisdiction clauses. For example, at the top of the chain, perhaps the head charter between the ship owner and the head charterer provides for New York law and arbitration. The next charter down uh, may specify uh, German law and GMAA arbitration in Hamburg. Uh, that's the German Maritime Arbitrators Association. Um, the next, perhaps, Singapore law and SCMA arbitration. That's the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration. And finally, perhaps at the bottom of the chain, uh, the charter may provide for English law and LMAA, that's London Maritime Arbitrators Association uh, terms, arbitration in London. Now, the cargo owner may have a claim for short delivery, let's say, or, or damage to the goods carried. And he may be able to bring that claim direct against the ship owner under the uh, contract evidence by the bill of lading. But perhaps there's a yet further unhelpful law and ju uh, jurisdiction clause in the bill of lading and the cargo owner decides to bring his claim under the charter party. Now, depending on the facts, that claim is likely to flow uh, all the way up the chain 
to the ship owner. But there are all these differing law and jurisdiction provisions, almost guaranteeing an extremely slow and expensive route to ultimate resolution. Indeed, matters may be yet more complex if the various contracts aren't completely back to back, and therefore there could be uh, differing issues and potential liability as between different parties in the chain. Now, you may think this sounds a bit fanciful, but um, for many years, I was engaged um, as a partner in a leading um, international shipping, uh, commercial law firm, uh, specializing particularly in shipping and international trade. And I can tell you that we regularly uh, dealt with such cases. So I've said a little about the difficulties stemming uh, from long contract chains with differing terms and perhaps law and jurisdiction clauses. Now there can also be cultural differences with parties from, uh, I think the jargon is uh, low context and others from high context cultures. Now, if time permits, and please do remind me, I can give you some practical examples uh, at the end. Uh, one of those is uh, personal and the other was related to me. Now, well, let me just give the, the, the shorter, easier one right now. Um, I was asked by my former law firm to go and set up its first office in Germany. And so I moved to Germany, lived there for a couple of years, and I had an um, application from uh, a young German gentleman and um, listened to all he had to say. And at the end, uh, having been not too impressed, I said, hmm, interesting. Now that young German was back on the phone to me within a day or two saying, uh, Mr. Lux, you said this is very interesting. So uh, when are we proceeding? And I then had to explain, look, your English is of course excellent. It's not a language issue, uh, but that's one of the nuances of, uh, 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 of the English that um, uh, let's say one let someone down lightly. So interesting means in English, it's never gonna happen. The Germans are much more direct. You say uh, to them, something's interesting and they expect it to happen uh, the next day. Now, um, of course, I, by the way, had the good fortune to attend, I think it was the International Mediation Institute's uh, first uh, course leading to a diploma in intercultural competence uh, that was held in the UK and a uh, fascinating course it was and the second cultural issue that I want to mention if time permits uh, which I'll come to at the end uh, in fact was related during that course. Um, of course you can't be aware uh, when you're speaking to uh, someone from a different culture of all the uh, facets where there may be differences. But what, uh, if you were alert to this, then it's taking you a long way towards uh, being on your guard and being prepared that there could be different reactions from the one you expect, not because the other party is being difficult, but because they do come from a cultural back. Uh, a, a different cultural background. So next point, how do these um, international trade disputes, how have they traditionally been dealt with? Well, um, many have been dealt with by high court litigation. And of course, if one of the parties has a strong enough uh, bargaining position, then that may mean the courts of his country. Uh, if, the, uh, if that's not the case, 
then perhaps a neutral court will be selected. And the um, commercial court in London is, I believe, uh, the most popular uh, international choice. I've heard it suggested, I don't vouch for these figures, that in about 70% of uh, London commercial court cases, at least one of the parties is foreign, non-English, and in over 50%, uh, both are foreign. So it's a popular international choice. Now, next up is arbitration. Uh, and certainly uh, very many shipping and international trade contracts uh, provide for uh, London arbitration. Indeed, there's a very recent study commissioned by one of the uh, leading international commercial, uh, sorry, international shipping law firms with its head office in London, uh, that has reported that over 80% of worldwide maritime disputes are arbitrated in London, quite a staggering figure. The English Commercial Court and um, London Maritime Arbitration may be efficient and popular, but in the nature of uh, things, litigation and arbitration are time consuming and expensive and do nothing to address the cultural dimension. In fact, to maximize neutrality, uh, many institutional arbitration rules expressly provide that the arbitrators must be of uh, different nationalities from those of the parties. And therefore, in effect, the arbitrators risk being, uh, if anything, culturally ring-fenced from the parties. Now, this is, of course, International Mediation Awareness Week, and it won't surprise you to hear me say that the solution to the problems I have outlined uh, is mediation, uh, coupled with some hybrids, which um, the Lux Mediation Panel is pleased to offer. And in about, well, less than an hour from now, uh, my panelists and I will be holding a mediation simulation, um, and that will um, demonstrate, I hope, uh, some of the advantages of mediation. What then are the differing um, ADR processes I'm referring to? Uh, perhaps I should start by saying there's no uniform uh, definition of ADR. Um, you know, in the old days, it was said it stands for alternative dispute resolution, but that uh, sounded to some almost wacky. Uh, some lawyers think it stands for alarming drop in revenue. Uh, but anyway, it's still a convenient um, acronym. So what procedures am I referring to? Uh, first of all, uh, there's, of course, uh, mediation itself, which offers the prospect of uh, quick and economic uh, dispute resolution, preserving the business relationship and with the potential for creative left field solutions, uh, which I hope will be demonstrated in our mediation simulation. I mean, the business relationship, that is a critical factor to stress because, um, you know, I was at the sharp end of some heavy litigation and arbitration cases over very many years. And it struck me that in many cases, even if my client won the piece of litigation, uh, the end result may be that the relationship, the business relationship, which had perhaps taken years to build up, uh, was burned on the altar of that litigation. So, uh, and I do recall the one time general counsel of General Electric, uh, general Electric GE saying something like, uh, you know, winning in business is not the same as winning in court. 
Um, so it, it, it really a very important factor. So beyond mediation, uh, there is the possibility of co-mediation. Now, some cynics may say, well, uh, why employ two mediators where one should do? However, I would um, seek to persuade you that there are cases in which two uh, co-mediators working uh, successfully together may bring about a resolution where one alone may fail. Um, to illustrate that point, and of course there are many examples, uh, it could be co-mediators because of language factors, because of um, different fields of expertise. I'm thinking predominantly now of cultural factors. And um, the fact is that the center of world trade has moved eastwards. There's a steadily growing number of international trade deals uh, concluded between Western and Eastern interests. And um, it's important that both parties, the Eastern and the Western parties be comfortable with the mediation, of course, that's, that's proposed. Now, uh, one of my co-panelists, Li Wai Pong, who is based in Singapore, and of Chinese origin, um, he and I have started offering a co-mediation service, which is precisely geared to address uh, these known uh, cultural differences between East and West. Our expectation is that Waipong's presence as mediator will give the uh, Eastern party the confidence that his underlying concerns will be recognized and addressed, and hopefully vice versa as regards the Western party and my, my presence. So far as we are aware, this is um, a, thus far anyway, a unique offering. Um, another of our offerings, and these are all um, detailed on our website, um, to which of course, you should refer if, if you would like more detail, is called um, early resolution. Now, this is particularly valuable for the multi-party chain contract cases, which I referred to earlier. The one thing that's certain in such cases is that they are extremely slow and expensive to resolve by traditional means. And that can lead often to complete inertia. As I know from firsthand experience, as I say, having handled uh, many of such cases, they can literally drag on for years. I think the oldest, longest running case I ever had, I inherited as what was then called a baby article clerk or trainee lawyer and finally got resolved uh, nearly 25 years later uh, when I um, left for Germany to set up the office in, in Hamburg. Now with the early resolution procedure, the idea is that an early resolution neutral is appointed at an early stage with the initial task of speaking in confidence with each party in the chain and drawing up a roadmap for resolution of the dispute. Whilst that may often lead to a formal mediation as the next step, um, often much earlier, by the way, a mediation taking place much earlier than might otherwise be the case, that is not necessarily um, the result of the early resolution neutrals intervention. It may be, for example, that speaking um, and the discussions the early resolution neutral has, by the way, are strictly private and confidential, just as the discussions a mediator uh, has with, with each party. So 
so I said the common result will be a mediation as next stage, but perhaps the early resolution neutral identifies that um, there's a difference of view between the parties as to the meaning of a particular clause uh, in the contracts, and that if that's resolved, that should unblock things. Now, if that's the position, then perhaps the suggestion would be that the parties proceed to whichever may be the appropriate court on a construction common uh, summons uh, to get an authoritative ruling as to the meaning of the clause. Or um, sometimes it happens that during those early discussions, the early resolution neutrals intervention suffices to uh, unblock dialogue between the key protagonists who are then able to take over themselves and talk constructively between themselves, uh, hopefully leading to um, a resolution. However, and this came as a surprise to me, what has happened certainly in some cases is that the discussion you hold with each party at that very early stage um, can itself lead to final resolution of the matter. As I say, when um, this scheme was dreamt up, which, which um, I, I must um, pay tribute to um, an advanced mediation course, which I attended at Harvard, which set me thinking along these lines, when this was set up, I didn't expect that there would be immediate resolution. I thought that there would be a next stage of either direct dialogue between the parties, a mediation or uh, something else to um, follow uh, bringing about resolution. Finally, let me mention um, two uh, processes um, we offer which are less facilitative in nature, but for which there is nevertheless demand. Uh, the first of those, um, ENE or early neutral evaluation. This, of course, involves being appointed by two disputing parties to provide a non binding opinion on the strength of the claim uh, and also the appropriate settlement figure or at least settlement range. The final process that I will mention uh, goes under the acronym of SCRIBE, which stands for Small Claims Resolved Independently by Experts. And I should say straight away that this is the brainchild of my uh, co-panelist, Li Wai Pong, um, the experience has been uh, his, which led him to these thoughts, and I must say shared by me, is that there are many, many small claims of less than, say, uh, US dollars 50,000, which are uneconomic to litigate or arbitrate, and where the parties may be afraid to mediate. Now, although the best available data, the, uh, which is, I suggest, the CEDA uh, biannual report, although that indicates that settlement is achieved uh, in over 85% of mediations, there is always the fear that perhaps yours may be one of the few which uh, doesn't settle, and where you may therefore be saddled not only with your unresolved claim, but also with the, on that hypothesis, wasted costs of the mediation. So to overcome that problem, Scribe offers a quick, inexpensive and reliable route to a decision and therefore to a guaranteed outcome. Therefore, for the first time, there is a route to ensure that such claims can be resolved and that they don't simply fester. Now, 
Um, you may say, and I don't know how many of um, those attending are, are lawyers in private practice, but I would guess a fair number. And um, many may say, well, that's not going to be of interest. You know, we have hourly, we have um, billable hours and billing targets, and you talk about cheap, cheerful, quick. But I'm going to suggest to you that, in fact, that you, sh you should have a real interest in this. And the basis for that suggestion can be summarized thus. Um, many busy law firm partners will have a number of important clients who generate perhaps a number of multi-million dollar claims. But for every multi-million dollar claims, there will be an even bigger number of smaller claims. So if the uh, partner says, sorry, we can't handle those claims cost effectively, then a smaller, uh, lower cost firm will be brought in to deal with those claims. And there is then the risk of course, that the client will ultimately say, you know, this smaller firm is doing a great job. They should be rewarded with the higher value claims as well. And therefore you, law firm partner, have lost your client. So I think there, uh, and there are numerous other reasons why uh, parties, institutional litigators, insurance companies, p &I clubs and the like, uh, should be extremely interested um, in this procedure. So, um, as I think I mentioned, uh, details of this scheme also and the rules uh, of Scribe um, are on the website. The final point I will touch on is enforcement. Um, now, the fact that parties are in mediation is no doubt because uh, at least one party suggests that the other has failed to perform the contract. Now, at the end of a mediation, a successful mediation, what do you end up with? Well, you end up with another contract. And who's to say? that the, uh, there's any better prospect of the second contract being performed. So um, enforcement is an important issue. Now, when um, mediation proceedings are commenced after uh, court or arbitration proceedings are underway, there is always the possibility, and that's something that uh, certainly has been done in my mediations many times, to draw up the mediation settlement agreement in the form of a consent court judgment or arbitration award. Indeed, actually much better, uh, if possible, as a consent arbitration award, because you then have the possibility of enforcement almost word worldwide under New York Convention. But that can be uh, cumbersome. And of course, not all mediations uh, take place after court proceedings have been commenced. Indeed, just a few days ago, I was mediating uh, an international our airport project dispute with um, a number of parties in from different countries and that mediation was taking place before court proceedings um, in fact the contracts provided for arbitration before arbitration proceedings had been started anywhere so uh, in that situation the new kid on the block, the new singer, the brand new Singapore International uh, Convention, providing for the international recognition and enforcement of mediation settlement agreements uh, comes into its own. 
So, for example, uh, we unfortunately in the UK, so preoccupied with Brexit, seem to have um, been stalling on just about everything else. We, I'm, uh, I regret to say, have not yet signed up to this convention. Um, but there are a number of uh, important players that have done, uh, just mentioning two, uh, China and India. So if, for example, um, a mediation takes place in India, leading to a settlement agreement, and that's not performed, and the uh, debtor has assets in China, now under the Singapore Convention, the mediation settlement agreement can be taken to China uh, and that would be entitled to recognition and enforcement. Very important. Um, arbitration is certainly at the moment the most popular method for the resolution of international commercial disputes. And many people put that down to the New York Convention for the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards. And as I've um, said, that's one of the most widely ratified uh, conventions of all times with over 160 uh, state signatories. Now, many are predicting that the Singapore Convention will do for international mediation what the New York Convention has achieved for international arbitration, in which case I can predict indeed a bright future for international commercial mediation.